Hey guys, Father Jordan here. Father Paul and I are gonna play catch. Father Paul, you wanna play catch? I'm reading. Hey, Father Paul, catch! Oh, that wasn't very good. Hey, Father Paul, catch! Hey, Father Paul, catch! Yeah, you got it! <laughs> Good afternoon, St. Eugene and St. Monica. This is Father Paul Hartman, Father Jordan Burkus. <laughs> I say we keep Burger. it. Yeah. I say we keep it. Yeah. Can't even get my last name. I'm yes. two priests in, in a podcast. Yes. Hope everybody's doing well today. Here you this lost is the this. I think you, frisbee. I think you lost this <laughs> earlier. Pretty good aim, huh, everybody? Yeah, we're going to talk about grounding. <laughs> grounding. We wanted to come to you today, especially to wish all the moms. Yep. Happy Mother's happy Day. Happy Mother's Day. We love Moms, we do. Don't we, we Father do. Paul? We do. I mean, Father Paul and I especially have uh, very strong relationships with our own mothers. Mm -hmm. yeah. Father Paul, uh, there's something fierce about the love of a mother, wouldn't you say? Well, uh, yeah, th just the whole stereotype of you know the mama bear or the you know that kind of just natural connection uh, is always there. I mean, the mother is the first one to really to know of the child to. First one to feed the child, first one. So, you know, God bless fathers, but, you know, it's mom is that first most intimate relationship. And then as you become an adult, you know, it's always, the, the, the sports players always say, hi, mom. Yeah, <laughs> that's true, isn't it? <laughs> After dad spent years and years and years practicing with them. Hi, mom. <laughs> how, uh, how has your mother shaped your faith? Oh, my mom, uh, my mom's just a classic Irish Catholic woman, came from a large family, very devout, very much kind of comfortable in her own place in the church, Not, and I don't say her own place in some sort of negative. She, you know, she was never highly, the, you know, the key volunteer doing everything. She was, her, her presence was devotional. Her presence was making sure her kids were there and in the Catholic school and participating and learning. Um, you know, we, we had to learn, you know, the, the mysteries of the rosary. We would pray the rosary at the dinner table, usually only a decade, you know, depending on how well behaved we were. Sure. Um, but she, you know, just, she grew up in a home where the priests were invited over a lot and, you know, both her parents were very involved. So that was just a part of our growing up that her lived faith at home in her prayer life and teaching us personal prayer and pious prayer. And then, uh, then, you know, she was in charge when the Hartman family went to mass at St. John Vianney in Brookfield and we would all line up and she would, she would direct who gets to go into the pew at what point, uh, because that would be an indicator of how well behaved we had been in the past week. So okay. <laughs> those who had to be closer to mom had to be watched a little sure, more. Sure. Yeah, yeah. She can give them a little, uh, yeah, very good. My mom, uh, has always been somebody of deep faith. Um, really from a young age, and she really instilled that in all of us kids. I would say, too, uh, my mom just has this capacity of really communicating warmth and love in a unique way, and she's always been a step ahead of me. So I would say, looking at my life, she always kind of knew where I was going before I did, um, but never, you know, kind of never stirred the water. She just wanted to make sure that um, I was listening to God, and she always prayed for my vocation as well. I would say we probably wouldn't be priests without our mothers, wouldn't you say? No. Uh, we, well, so there's a, a, an interesting quick little story. I had asked in uh, beginning or early eighth grade to go to the high school seminary, and my mother had a brother, my uncle, my Uncle Billy, who went to high school seminary and did not have a good experience. So my mom said no. I said, okay. Then as I was kind of getting into my junior year, I asked about going to college seminary and it was I was in my senior year she said no and she said no and said please do just one year you know as a regular freshman at university and and then think about it and so then when I was a freshman at University of Wisconsin at Milwaukee here uh, I didn't tell mom and I applied to seminary <laughs> okay. but it was it was the right thing to do it was a good thing to do my my vocation is stronger my discernment was better 
because of that, I think. So. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. She's not against anybody's vocation. She just wanted it to be right. Good wanted practical it to be right. advice. Mm-hmm. Oh, I think that's important. So, uh, happy Mother's Day to all those moms out there. Uh, we love our moms, and we love all of you moms. Okay, what do you, how would you describe your mom behind her back? We see in our family. I'm, you know, I'm, there are seven of us. We call mom the Iron Lady. My mom, the Iron Lady, for a variety of reasons. Because she looks, and even though she's not British, she sounds like Margaret Thatcher. Oh, really? Back in the prime of her life. Okay. And so we just started in the in the eighties, you know, calling mom Margaret Thatcher or the Iron Lady, which was a nickname for Margaret Thatcher. Do you have a name like that? We don't know. I my mom just a she she's deep. She loves a lot. She's got an incredible heart. Um, so we don't have any nicknames. <laughs> Okay, maybe I'm the weird one yeah. in this case. Yeah. Our nickname is Mom. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, anyways, um, so transitioning from moms to mom, we all have the same mother, uh, Jesus' mother. Uh, so on this Mother's Day, we can't forget about Our Lady. And this month of May, Mother's and this Day, month this of month May. of May, devoted to her. Uh, always interesting, we begin the month of May with St. Joseph, her husband. We yeah. we. For most of May, it's the Easter season, so her son and the di- the disciples becoming church, and there's just something a wonderful coincidence of purpose with those different aspects. Her, her very up. her very humanity of having a husband, and you know, then her kind of not talked about greatly in the Acts of the Apostles, but always presumed to be present and somewhere nearby, really until. We we see the uh, the assumption towards the towards the uh, later parts, so it's I think it's a great complement to what we're hearing in the scriptures this month, and our consideration of Mary. Sure, Father Paul, uh, why do we worship Mary? <laughs> we don't worship Mary. We don't. Worship a lot of Mary. people think that we and do. We right? do. They do. You know, we, we should we should have made a list ahead of time to go through the the big myths about Mary. Yeah. One certainly, we're criti- you know the criticism we get. You worship Mary and the saints. No, where are I think, all these statues? Yeah. It's 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 idolatry. We're we're bowing down to thing people that are not God. Right. I think the best way to sum it up is like going back to the discussion of our mothers. That I have in my room, uh, you know, a picture of mom. I have a picture of my late father, I have a picture of my family, but I have a picture, a separate picture of mom, just because of a reminder of everything she gave us. Then I think the greatest practical scripture story to best understand our our corporate, our overall relationship uh, with Mary, with Our Lady, is the wedding feast at Cana. Hmm. Because it's a wonderfully beautiful moment where Jesus says, woman, it's not my time yet. Yeah. And essentially, you get the impression he doesn't want to do this. He does. He doesn't think he should. He doesn't want to. And like a good then Jewish mother, or now a good Catholic mother of of a priest or any profession, she ignores the Lord completely and just says, "Do what he says. He's going to do the right thing. He's going to do what I've asked." Yeah. And that is why we seek her. We can so understand in her motherhood, why she's the perfect intercessor on our behalf. What is an intercessor? An intercessor is a person who, whom we go to and say, pray for me or help me in my prayer. Can you, can you also bring my need before the Lord? And the trust that we have that Mary's closeness to the Lord is per- perfect then we, you know, it's it's a worthwhile thing. We ask her and present to her our need, and she doesn't answer the need. She doesn't bring about the fruition by herself. She goes to her son and says, this is a genuine bona fide need. And and that's, that's why. That's why it's so pivotal to understand how we are as a church because it's that reality, that incarnate need, and that family that helps us understand who Christ can be for us and who Christ, what Christ can do for us. Yeah, there's a certain uh, power that a mother has or authority that a mother yep. has over her children. And so when my mom asks me to do something, it has a much more weight than somebody else. Oh, know? yeah. Oh, yeah. I'm, I'm sure it's the same thing. I could go, we could go through the... It could work its way down the line through all six of my siblings asking for one thing. Sure. No, no. I could come up with the excuses. Then mom asks... 
Okay, <laughs> I'm doing it. It's, it's a so, given. Yeah, we ask Jesus' mother, who he has given to us, our mother, to help us. So we, we don't worship Mary. Uh, we worship, we pray through Mary we to venerate Jesus. Her. We venerate we her. We venerate her in the sense that we are brought to a sense of the spiritual, of a closeness to Christ because of her. Yeah. But we don't worship. Okay. Worship is reserved for the Lord. That's right. The saints. Uh, we don't worship the saints either. Mm -hmm. um, they. What are the saints? How do? Wh where are they? <laughs> well, the saints. So, like Mary, a practical example, a a practical, lived and incarnate presence of of the Christian life, of the, a relationship with Christ. We talk, you know, as they move through the uh, the process, you know, of beatification and, and canonization. You know, think of some of the, the the terms that are used to start the process. We they have to be proven to have he, heroic virtue. Yeah. So just that that sense of I want to live my life as it's compelled by graciousness, by blessing, by virtue, and to do so in a heroic way, a way that sets them apart. Something that's remarkable. Yeah. yeah. Then they are referred to as a servant of God. So it's remarkable virtue. It's service, and then they're blessed. They're blessed. Their name can be lifted up in the Eucharist. And this is prayer. all after a an in depth analysis of their life, their yes. writings, interviews with people that yes. that knew that. Um, yeah, we could do whole episodes, yeah. multiple episodes on it. You know, even with someone taking on the the devil's advocate. That's That's, right. that's where that term comes from. Someone to argue, you know, against them becoming Jordan, saints. Yeah, Jordan in his life was not holy enough. You know, or yeah. someone was they they look for the flaws and they try to bring them to bear as to does this undermine the case for their sanctity? But if somebody makes it to being declared a saint, we believe that they're in heaven. They're in the presence of God, yes. Yeah. Yes. And it takes what? Two miracles, right? Uh, unless you're a martyr. Among other things. Among other things, but... yeah. You know, the heroic life, the the you know, the study that bears out their their faith and the depth of their faith. And then to prove that they are an intercess intercessor before the Lord by petitioning them, by asking their intercession, a miracle occurs, a, a healing miracle. That can't be explained by, um, any we, by science or medicine. Yeah. yeah. Now we do give, you know, those who are martyrs, they don't have quite the same criteria. A martyr is somebody sacrifice. who's uh, shed their blood, given their life um, as a result of their faith. Mm -hmm. so. mm -hmm. But there's a, a specific saint that you had a role in a little video for yes, a little movie for yes. Before we get to that, though, oh, before we get to just that, just an encouragement okay. that the saints are also people that we can befriend um, and ask for help, much like we ask for Mary's intercession, her prayers. The saints as well, we ask for their prayers because mm -hmm. we believe in them to be in the presence of God. We believe that they have a powerful. Um, they can assist us powerfully. So get to know the well, saints. And they, and they teach us so much. I about mean, their lives. You, you know, if you're not, a, learn what you can about St. Monica and St. Eugene if you're our, our parishioners. If you're at, you know, whatever yeah. parish you're at, learn about the patron saint. Learn about the, 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 the saints of your, your confirmation name, your baptismal name. Pick at least one saint and get to know them. Mm -hmm. Become their friend, especially during this time. Uh, Father Paul, who's your favorite saint? Well, I've said this before. Uh, my favorite, St. Joseph. Yeah, good one. Uh, St. Joseph. I would then place two more modern saints, Maximilian Kolbe and John Paul. John Paul II. Those yeah, are, that would be my triumvirate. Yeah, for it. yeah that's a, those are probably... My favorite is St. Francis of Assisi. As a young kid, I always loved animals and mm -hmm. um, just read his life, and he became my confirmation saint. Uh, they say he was like another Christ, which I suppose all the saints really are, which is why they Should have be, this yeah. heroic virtue. Yeah. Yeah. Speaking of mothers and saints, <laughs> my mother has been working on and producing and just released a video on a local uh, blessed. So this man is one step away from being declared a saint. And mm. where was he born, Father Paul? He was born in Wisconsin. Wisconsin. Oak Grove, Wisconsin. That's right, yeah. Not the present day Oak Grove because I Googled it and it wasn't the same place as in the video. Can you believe it? We've got a man born in Wisconsin who is on his way to being declared a saint. And he actually went to the same seminary that Father Paul and I went to, at least yes, for a little at bit. At least for a little bit. Yeah, what's the name of that St. seminary? St. Francis Father de Paul? Sales Seminary St. here Francis in Milwaukee. St. Francis de Sales St. Francis, Wisconsin. Seminary. Yeah. yeah. Um, and what was this guy's name? Well, 
he when he was uh, when he became a member of the Franciscans, uh, he he was given the name Mary Solanus. So, but he was born Barney, right? I think. Yeah, Bar Bernard Barney. Solanus Casey. Solanus Casey. Yeah. So, blessed Solanus Casey. We really encourage you to watch this video and get to know this local saint. It's powerful to imagine, especially as we're walking through the halls of St. Francis, yeah. that this man walked the same halls. You know, he looked at the same trees on that front drive. Uh, he prayed before the same statue of Our Lady mm -hmm. uh, in the Eucharistic Chapel. Uh, it really kind of... I don't know, puts things into perspective to realize that there are saints among us, uh, and he's one of them. Well, I'm, one of the things, the, the video is wonderful, but they talk about how he only spent a certain amount of time at the seminary, and they'll make an illusion that his 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 grades were a little iffy or, or whatnot. I well, they forget didn't, how it was said. Yeah, they didn't kick him out. Essentially, the, the he had, language yeah, was he, rigorous. Yeah, back in those days, he, it was still required in Milwaukee that a seminarian learn and master German. Yeah. And he was of Irish descent. They never had any German background, any German language. He was from a farm community that you know, wasn't there. So he had tremendous difficulty with it. So eventually it was just found he would not be able to finish his academics. They didn't kick him out, but right. he was he was strongly encouraged, encouraged to consider other options. Life. And yeah. and yeah, his spirituality made made uh, a religious community m very appealing to him. Yeah. So. Just a couple of things about Solanus that we wanted to share with you. One of the things he's most famous for is his motto to thank God ahead of time. So a lot of times we pray and we ask God for things, but um, he had a different approach. Ask for something, pray for somebody, and at the end of this prayer, thank God for hearing your prayer. Mm -hmm. It was an incredible amount of faith and trust that Solanus had uh, in God, um, a real simplicity of heart. And he very also, much, yeah. he himself had a very strong devotion to Our Lady. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, while he was praying about his vocation in this time of turmoil, am I not called to the, the diocesan priesthood? He actually hears within his heart the voice of Our Lady, which says, go to Detroit. So that's when he joins the Capuchins in Detroit uh, and begins this road of the religious life. So he yep. spent time in Detroit. He spent time in Milwaukee. He spent time in New York. And essentially his role was, you know. The, the porter, the doorman, the doorman. Yeah. doorman. Um, All he did was open the door and, yeah. and listen to people. Uh, and a, a lot of healings occurred yeah. as a result it was of called a, It was called a simplex priest. And they were very common in larger religious orders for a variety of reasons. And it came about a little bit because, again, his, his difficulty in some academic work and the languages, he was not thought to have been hugely intelligent so he was not given he was not going to be given faculties to f preach mass so a simplex priest can't hear confessions and and can't preach at mass and so but the people saw his holiness and they saw the depth of his spirituality and they would talk to him just at the door you know they i I want to talk to a priest okay you know I'll go get father so and so no we want to talk to father Solanus Casey Thousands of people, and, and it became would line up, the nature yeah. of, of his ministry and his presence. I, I just, you know, one of the reasons I brought up the story of you know his not continuing at St. Francis de Sales Seminary. I mean, it's not about an intellectual mastery that our faith really moves forward. Yeah. We need it. We're a, we're a church of great academics and great intellect, but boy, that simplicity, or you know, the simplex priest, but that simplicity of just a lived, devout faith is is that's what hugely, it's all about. Yeah, it's hugely yeah. important. The gift of faith. So we will include a link to this uh, film for you to watch on our Facebook. Uh, we hope that you enjoy it and get to know Blessed Solanus Casey, soon to be, I would imagine, yeah. Saint Solanus Casey, a local yeah. saint. Uh, and this is an encouragement also to get to know the saints. Ask for their help. Yep. Get to know Learn our lady. Every day. Do a every saint day. of the day. Do a saint of the day. Yeah, that's right. That's one of Father Paul's things. He begins every meeting with, who's the saint, saint of, of the, the day? day. Yeah. yeah. So. And, uh, and be careful with the Frisbees. <laughs> careful with the Frisbees. And happy Mother's Day, Mom. <laughs> happy Mother's Day. Blessings uh, We love you. you, Moms. And thank you yeah. for teaching us the faith uh, and for loving us. Um, is it your turn to bless or mine? 
I think it's yours. May Almighty God bless you, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Thanks for joining us on Two Priests in a a podcast. Podcast. God bless you.